Good morning. My name is Bethany Maddox and I'm a member of the customer care team here at Vitech Corporation. I'm very pleased to be your host for this webinar today as we welcome Nick Serbik presenting Experiencing the Systems Engineering Process as a Serious Game. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to review just a few technical details. First, questions. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time using the chat and questions function in the GoToWebinar window. We will be monitoring these throughout today's event and we plan to respond to questions at the end of the webinar, so stay tuned. The webinar is being recorded today. An online archive with this presentation will be available within 24 hours of the live version. I believe that takes all care of all the housekeeping, so let's get started. Let me introduce our presenter today. Nick Serbik teaches systems engineering at the University of Groningen. He obtained his computer engineering degree and his PhD in artificial intelligence at the Technical University of Timisoara in Romania. He worked previously as a teacher and researcher at both the Free University of Amsterdam and the Technical University of Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Please join me in welcoming Nick Serbik. Nick, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, I'm Nick Serbik, and I'll start with a joke. Uh, we say back in Romania that uh, those people who can do something, they do it. Those people who cannot really do it, they will teach it. And they speak, those people who cannot teach it, they become politicians. And um, I wanted to tell you just from where I'm coming because I'm from the second group. I'm an academic, so maybe I cannot do things, but uh, I try to teach them. Um, my presentation today will be... Uh, We'll start uh, with the question if it is possible to, to, I will try to answer the question if it is possible to teach something like creativity. I'll continue to explain how I'm teaching an introductory course in system engineering and how I try to also teach students to be creative. And uh, because I employ concepts and techniques from serious gaming, I will try to explain what is the gaming dimension of the course where I'm doing. Um, and finally, I will try to speak back to, to Vitec, the Vitec Corporation and try to tell them, in a sense, uh, what kind of requirements I would have from a gaming-centric core system to tease the students better, in a better way, by using these gaming tricks, I call them. Now, um, I always have been confronted with the problem that teaching students how to design, it's extremely difficult. Because I was also teaching other disciplines, lots of them. It's a long list of disciplines I was teaching in computer science, engineering, and mathematics. And um, the basic disciplines are rather easy to teach. So students in during their bachelor years are learning this with relative ease. However, to teach how to apply in a creative way, these learn techniques from the bachelor years, it's much, much more difficult. So they have a, lots of skills, but how to combine them in a creative way, like I say here, uh, colors in a painting, it's a much more difficult task. Now, in engineering design, actually, there is some research done about it, but it's we don't have a stan standard way to teach creativity in en engineering design. So. Even if you look for, for, for research or methods in this domain, there are none. Uh, in the Netherlands, because I worked in a in, in few of the technical universities in the Netherlands, and not only technical universities, our university is not really a technical university, but, but I am on the engineering side. The typical approach is that we form teams of three, four, five students. Uh, the Dutch are uh, well renowned for the polder spirit, for the team spirit. They, because this is a country which is built on sand and you have to build dikes and of course you cannot build the dike only in front of your house, you have to make a team work with your neighbors. So they are very good in that. Uh, and we give them assignments which are out of their comfort zone. And this is something which is usually something which is different from what they have learned before. And the formulation of the problem is rather vague because we leave them to finish the formulation of the problem. So they can solve their own problem in, in a way, which is interesting for them because they can elaborate and imagine more about the problem. 
But this is not sufficient in my opinion. So I studied a bit uh, the psychology of teaching and I realized that th there is more what is needed than, than just making teams and giving them a difficult assignment. You have to achieve something, something which the psychologists of learning called intrinsic motivation. And this can be achieved by creating a challenge for the students, arise the curiosity of the students, and spur the imagination, even the fantasy. So make them really think out of the box or in a, about crazy, crazy, let's say, things. And also, you have to make them believe that actually they can develop their design assignment in a very autonomous way. And also make them believe, strongly believe, that from the start they have all the skills which allow them to attain their goal. So this is called the, in psychology, self-efficacy belief. And also makes them very interested and engaged in, in mastering the topic and not the grade. The grade it's called in psychology extrinsic motivation. So makes them enjoy what they do. Now, what is a discipline under discussion here? Uh, I'm teaching the core, uh, an introductory uh, introductory course in systems engineering, which is called the engineering this design of systems. And the student group is the fourth year of master students from a program called industrial engineering and management. And students from computer science and energy and other uh, uh, disciplines attend. So this is a building where I'm teaching this course. And uh, each year I have 75 to 100 students. Uh, 20-25% are different than the industrial engineering management program. So it's quite a big class. The course assignment is the following. Design a system that is heterogeneous, needs a multidisciplinary design team. So it's not only software or only a chemical system, but it has everything, also human, and also has a strong social technical flavor. So a system which comprises humans. And moreover, the enactment of the problem should solve a problem or take advantage of an op opportunity. So, for example, they have to build a plant to produce something. So that can be the system. That's one example. What is required in the end to be presented as the assignment result? The description of the problem, so they have to refine it and explain it better to the end. And the operational concept of the system, in terms of scenarios and requirements, and the functional, physical, and allocated architectures, as they are usually presented in the systems engineering discipline. There are two phases of this assignment. The originating requirement documents, which is basically presented always on paper. And this is a sort of document which in a real project would facilitate the communication between the designers and the, st and the stakeholders of the system, the so-called customers. So the ORD, as it is called in the books. and the SRD, which is a system requirement document, which is actually a reflection of the first document, but it's presented always to me as an A80, from now on probably A90 core file, so the core repository, which is always aligned with the ORD. And this is, in practice, supposed to be the re data repository, knowledge repository, model repository, which facilitates the communication with the integration engineers. And these two are developed concurrently, and I'm teaching the students that, of course, these are two sides of the same coin. I'm using a textbook, which probably many people who teach um, system engineering out there are using, so the book of Dennis Beauty. And uh, they also strongly recommend the use of core and uh, either zero diagramming for the functional architecture. And, uh, this book, actually, it's a, I like very much this book, and uh, um, it has an example, which is also available on the web. It's, uh, it's an elevator as a system. Now, this is a very nice example, but it's not uh, challenging, and it's not uh, interesting enough, in my opinion. So it's not really arousing the, the imagination of the students. So it's a very nice example to study, to study how, how things are presented. And uh, we are developing completely different kind of systems in my course. And uh, for example, we developed in the past a helium-3, which is a, 
potential fuel for uh, fusion reactors of the future. Helium-3 harvesting on the moon. So a very complex system which includes also the transport to the earth of the harvested material or harvesting solar energy on a very large scale in space for example this was one of the best projects I, I had last year or in the desert which I have this year or energy storage and distribution for a city the whole system with hydro compressed air and hy hydrogen so very sustainable and green so this kind of systems They're a bit crazy sometimes so uh, sometimes we are developing even systems in the past so historic systems in a sense um, the main focus of the course is the systems functional architecture because being an introductory course my main um, uh, aim for this course is to teach to the students to think functional so think the system in functions which is always something completely new for, for students they are as any human here we think the system in physical terms, in components. In functional terms, which is much more abstract, it's much more difficult to reason about. So I have to implant this first kind of thinking in my students. And based on the functional requirements and operational scenarios, they should learn how to analyze uh, the, these requirements and develop the needed functionality and derive new requirements which are presented to the stakeholders. And of course, they should depict the discovered and, and developed functions in core and they should capture the interaction between these functions with either of zero diagrams. Now how I, how I use the gaming dimension in the assignment. So what is a game? A game it's a controlled context with rules played among adversaries trying to win various objectives. This is my favorite kind of game but of course we are not playing this one in, in, my, in my course. Uh, we use something called a serious game approach and this is used nowadays because of its entertainment factor and the implicit challenge to win. It's used in, for example, staff level war games or in training, business training, engineering education, policy decision making support, strategic communication between real adversaries like the games they are playing now between US and China war games, cyber war games, just to make the two parties understand each other better and their fears and their, their type of reactions. So we try to do a serious game in which this assignment is developed. Now, how the organization, how the, 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 the assignment is organized? There are a few phases. So first of all, I always work with teams of three students and uh, actually if one student in a team is hitchhiking, he can be voted out by the other two. And uh, the whole assignment is spread over eight teaching weeks with the final exam presentation in week 10, when the team has to sell its design in front of the teachers. Um, there are four formal deliverables. Uh, in week two, they have to present the high concept, which is the problem and the, pro the problem to be solved and the system to be, which will solve this problem in a short document, let's say not more than four pages. The operational concept, which is already a dual deliverable, a paper-based document and the core file is, is in week four, where we start to have certain aspects of the system de de defined in, in core the completed functional architecture in week six and the completed allocated or physical arch architecture in week eight. Now, what kind of roles uh, students can play or teams of students can play in, in my serious game? Each team will play three roles. Uh, they can be customer and stakeholders. And they will, in this role, they will ask questions. They can be system designers, and usually the system designers are mostly answering questions, and technical auditors. And they are also asking questions about the models and the, the mistakes which exist in the models and so on. How is the game it's organized? Um, I organize the teams in, in bigger groups called triads because each triad has three teams of three students. So a triad is nine students in total. So this year I had, for example, 10 triads. And the role of customer and auditor are played within these strides. And the order of the roles can or cannot change with it. It's up to the students to decide how they, 
So each week they can change for a new role. And of course, we can have a maximum of six types of interactions per week in each triad. And for example, if I have in a triad team X, team Y, and team X can play customer to team Y, this is the first interaction. Team X can play auditor to team Z, second interaction, and then the other four interactions can be explained here. So this is how each time a team plays two roles against two other teams and each other team is interrogated two times by other teams. So this is happening in one week. They usually have one hour for each interaction. So this is how uh, the game, let's say, it's organized. How to foster competition? Each week, beside the, the formal deliverables, an intermediary deliverable has to be presented by a team to the other two teams in the tribe. And this is a partially finished ORD up to that week and an SRD. And each active role in a tribe is, has to fill an audit document, a customer audit document, um, a uh, auditor audit document, or a model audit document. And the documents are prepared by me, so the format of the document is fixed. And um, Based on the, what they have learned during the lectures and the tutorials, they should learn to, how to identify logic flaws in the design documents. And of course, the defending teams can answer and explain this was our reasoning and maybe explain why or discuss together why the, the, the mistake appeared. Or maybe it's not a mistake, so they have to defend. And the instructors, which, are, which is for the group of instructors, it's myself and, and my student assistants, we are playing as umpires in this game. So if conflict arises, we have to uh, mediate the conflict. And of course, based at the end of the week, based on the audit document and the umpire assessment, each team gets a score. So we can have a ranking of the teams and the triads uh, each week, which brings the game dimensions, the competitive dimensions with, to this exercise. Now, um, each week, of course, the teams can see the progress of the other teams, and uh, they can see also all the deliverables via the uh, web uh, site of the course. So they can see the good teams, how they went forward, and they can see the laggards, what they did wrong. So they can learn from this. Uh, and what uh, also increases competition is that the instructors compete themselves. So it's a call, so called Team Zero. We are developing our own assignment, and it's also assessed in a triad and also appears on the scoreboard. So this year it didn't work so well, this part, but uh, for the next year we try to make it more, uh, so really to, you, you, have to, you can compete with your teacher if you want. Um, the teams that finished in the end above team zero, so the teams which beat the teachers, and that's possible, uh, they get the highest mark possible because um, we teachers, we give us the next to the best, but teams which can beat us, they get the best mark. And each year I have at least one or typically two teams which get the maximum mark because they really put lots of effort and uh, they, they come with very good results. The final contest or the final part of the game is that they have to present this developed system in front of the whole class. So they have half an hour to make a sort of, sort of sales pitch in which they explained, they are, they, they are supposed to explain why their system is so good. And they have to imagine that themselves that the same system, it's has many, the same design may have many vendors, but only one customer. So they have to convince the, the customers that this is the best design. And of course the instructor, instructors will play here the role of the customers. So we take the go-no-go -go decision for the development of the system. So if we take a go decision, they pass this course, of course. Of course, the quality of the presentation is also bringing some bonus uh, to, to the team presenting. The four formal deliverables, which are in week two, four, six, and eight, they are also assessed but only by the instructors. And of course, the team can get or, uh, or lose points for the quality of these deliverables. And after 
these deliverables are presented. Each team has, each triad actually has one hour, so each team has 20 minutes um, of feedback from the instructors. We, we, we do this three times after deliverable one, two, and three. And uh, so in weeks three, five, and seven, we explain what was run to and wrong, and they can ask questions. And we explain what kind of potential improvements can be made by them. Uh, now I'll come to the last part of my presentation because I'm using um, uh, Core, of course, as a software supporting my course. But this year it was a, more or less the first time, time when I used Core as a game supporting uh, software. But I would say it was quite difficult because I would prefer I, it would have been much better, of course, if core would have been organized like a game. So I propose here a set of requirements which may transform core. Of course, uh, VTech is uh, <laughs> free to decide to take such a step uh, if they want to develop such a game. But they can at least adapt uh, the current system to, 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 to be used in this way. So for example, in the first week, actually students know only three concepts, requirement, function, and component. So um, because this is, a, let's say, the paradigm of, of uh, the system engineering teaching I'm using. So, um, for example, they in, in the first week I would let the students to reverse engineering an existing system. So look at this guy flying with balloons. And uh, the first level of the game would be that each team sketches a physical system design, a physical system model, and then they reverse engineer into a functional architectures. For example, here I would have a main function fly, which is decomposed by three sub-functions, lift, structure, and thrust. And these three functions are allocated or performed by these components, helium, balloons, and string, and width. So this will be a very simple exercise in the first week, just to pass the first level. So each level should have only the functionality that is serving the game at that level. So the, the, the core system should be should have only those buttons and elements available which is which are used at that level. So keep it as simple for that level as possible. Because this will enhance the passing through the steep learning curve at the beginning. So students have this problem that in the first three, four weeks with core they really struggle to understand what is happening. There are too many things on the screen and they are a bit lost. But if they will have only a few things to access and only a very few things to do, they will learn faster. And of course, after reaching, uh, after fulfilling the requirements of level one or two, so the results should be easy to check by the instructors. And the instructor, instructors will let the students to go to the next level, next level, which is, of course, much more complex. On level two, which will be in week two, based on the high concept of the system proposed, because now they delivered, they are already ready to deliver their deliverable one, which is the high concept of the system, the context has to be reversed engineered. And the results will be a hierarchy of functions and components of the context, including the, the surroundings of the system, including the system to be, ha to be which have, has to be in, in, this, uh, in these diagrams. And they have only to describe the main input and output operation requirement of the system. So at the level of requirements, not too much has to be done at this level. For example, the physical architecture of the context, for example, for the system I propose this year for Team Zero, which is a cross-docking system for pallets, for pallet uh, road freight transportation. We have external systems like customers, logistic operators, Comotrans, which is our system, which is a cross-docking system, and the owner of Comotrans, which can be a main logistic operator. And of course, we reverse engineer this into functions. So we have customer functions, operator functions, transshipment and consolidation as a function. And we'll have this function hierarchy of our context of the system. So that will be sufficient to pass into level three. 
Now, based on the scenario of interaction between the functions in the system to be and the functions of the surrounding system, now the A-1 di diagram is, is, is clearly defined in this level three. And based on the main requirements, three or more alternatives for the A-0 decompositions are proposed. For example, we, for, for, for my system, this would be the A-1 diagram. You can see here that I have interaction between all functions. For example, you can see the pallets which are flowing, shipment orders, and so on. So something like this will be the result which makes, enables the students to pass to the next level. And for example, an alternative for the A0 decomposition. And actually I'm doing research in the area of cross-docking systems. So these are the main four functions which I consider are the most important for cross-docking. So provide physical flow, visibility, schedule all operations, provide cross-docking, detect and solve problems. So that would be the first level. But of course, a safety critical system will have safety, provide safety, provide security here at this level. So each system would have a different uh, first level decomposition. And of course, the students have to propose a few alternatives and one of the best will be selected. In level four, the interaction I of zero diagrams for the first level decompositions are tried for all alternatives. But of course, the best after this uh, interaction capturing will be selected to continue with the next levels of decomposition. And of course, now requirements are traced back into the requirements in, in the SRD, in the core file, and also in the ORD, in the paper document, which is supposed to be used in the communication with the stakeholders. Level five, we continue the functional decomposition. And normally in our eight weeks, we, we cannot go more than three, four levels. So the second and third, maybe parts of the fourth level are done. And then usually we encounter the leaf function and we start to find generic components which are performing these functions. And we have to update accordingly the requirements in order to be able to communicate with other stakeholders in a very easy and controlled way. And finally, we can start to propose generic components. You can say this is played by a, this function is played by a donkey or a horse or, the, or a mule, for example. So we start to propose generic components. So P. but it can be a human, it can be a robot, it can be a generically modified monkey or whatever. Um, the functional architecture at level six is considered frozen. So from here, we have to do functional build up. So we select alternatives for the generic components. We discuss the trade-offs because in the ORD, we have a, also a, so the so-called um, fundamental objectives hierarchy, which is sort of priorities uh, of the stakeholders. So we can select it's a very automated system. It's a very manual system. Or it's a very expensive system, it's a very safe system, it's a very fast system, it's a very performance system. So we can go on various, on various, various trade-off dimensions and start to discuss how we can build up now from this generic components of modules. And finally, we, we built up the components into modules based on engineering constraints and physical constraints, and we build up in subsystems. And finally, we reach the system to be, which was supposed to be the final goal of our project. Now, in the end, three physical architectures are proposed by, based on same functional architecture. So they have different features and different advantages and disadvantages. So in, we have to discuss the pros and cons, cons of, of all these um, alternatives for the physical architecture. And uh, generic components are instantiated an estimation for costs and risk are made. So for example, we say we select that software package, that uh, uh, compressor, that engine, that battery, whatever. And a decision for the best system is made. And then actually we finish the game and the system is ready to be integrated and built. Now, uh, I have two main conclusions. So I am now ending my presentation. The first conclusion is that compared with the previously applied 
classical still style of teaching when I when still we, we are doing this uh, this uh, assignments competitive gaming it's more productive so I since I'm using it I have more engaged students much better presence much better results and also students are much more enthusiastic and you can see at the end in the quality of their deliverables that they their understanding is much higher. Those are the questions they are asking, the discussions we are having in the, in the end. Are much, I, I really can say it's a, it's a, it's a strong improvement as, uh, uh, in the classical way of teaching. Um, we can use Core in its current form as a supporting platform for this game. Okay, it's not at all a system which is, was even there is there are zero requirements for this system if I look into it for serious gaming but emulating a game it can be used uh, for future work I'll try to introduce these seven levels next year so I actually I use core we even without having the levels in core but I will try to emulate the game in the classical core which is seven levels. So each week we progress from one level to the other and they are allowed to, to go to the next level only if they satisfy the instructors. And of course in this process I will continue to refine the requirements for a game, a game platform which would be an interesting project, project for, to do maybe. Uh, and of course I'm, I'm very keen to hear uh, feedback from other lecturers and professionals about my approach because this is the first time ever when I'm presenting this approach uh, to the external world so and actually this was the first year when a full game uh, context was employed so going back to the to the first joke I to the joke I made uh, when I started my presentation I don't know if I can for once make a real system out there so I participated in my professional life in various system developments but I was never been really a system engineering but I believe that teaching it in this way it's a very good idea so I am uh, prepared now to to receive questions from the audience thank you very much Thank you, Nick. That was really interesting. I love hearing how instructors are teaching with CORE in their classroom. Um, I've enjoyed your presentation. I hope everyone else on the line has too. Let's go ahead and move to questions from our audience. We have received a few, um, so I thank those who submitted them. I encourage everyone to join the discussion and submit your questions at any time using the questions and chat function in the GoToWebinar window. Let's get started, Nick. Your first question is from Tommy, and he's asking, why do you think it's worthwhile for Vitech to make this effort to adapt the university edition of Core to be used as a game platform? Uh, that's a very difficult question. Um, yes, <laughs> that's a question also for Core, I, I, I would say. But um, I, I will come with a parable here, a, a story, because I was I was working in the 90s with many companies because I was teaching ERP systems and I was working with various uh, ERP vendors because I was using university editions of the ERP uh, uh, solutions in class like uh, BAN and uh, which is used by Boeing for example it's here today it's called different thing now so. and um, an SAP and actually looking back into the history of the last 20 years of, of, of how the marketplace evolved in, in the ERP uh, area, I can say those companies which had a very good relationship with university consortiums and Vitek is an excellent example in this aspect, actually thrived. These companies thrived. Companies which focused too much on the customers and forgot the educational, the universities, the academia, uh, in the, uh, so, so they, they just didn't took too much didn't put too much effort into their relation with universities and teachers in the long term they lost so I think there may be an incentive for companies like Vitek to, 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 to transform because gaming is a very very powerful paradigm in, in, in for, for, for young people today in the world so they are used to the, to, to the internet and to computers and and, and, and gaming is part of their lives and, and, and they like to learn by gaming so I think 
it's a matter of time that many software vendors who have very strong relations with with uh, with, with, with academia will will also try to go into this direction, making their products maybe look more like games and, and encourage teaching by, by, by serious game. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Nick. Our, our next question is from Andrew. And Andrew wants to know, how do you think the simulation features in Core can be used to enhance the outcomes of your game-supported teaching? I think that's the missing level. So maybe uh, level eight could be used even in the emulation uh, uh, version uh, without, let's say, having core as a game. But I can use the simulation features, for example, doing transfer functions in in, in, in the functional architecture. Uh, to be honest, I have to say I haven't used yet proper, because the course, it's only in an introductory course, and we have another simulation course, and they use other kind of software. But I am now working towards, let's say, linking the course of my colleagues in simulation with my course and maybe we'll use also core in their class only for simulation their class is happening before my class so maybe one of the levels in the future can be that they also have to simulate for example at some level of the functional architecture development to simulate parts of the or the entire functional architecture having mathematical descriptions of the transfer uh, uh, transfer model of the functions so I hope this uh, satisfies Andrew my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Um, our next question is from Mark. And Mark wants to know how you incorporate system data exchange across the levels. Um, actually, the, the, any exchange between, between function is just uh, realized via the items in, in, in the functional architecture. Uh, we are not developing links between components when we build up the, fun the physical architecture. So um, we can have, for example, a, a data model for a certain item between two functions if it's a data exchange between those two functions, which if we define it as a data exchange. But that's already very physical, so we don't really go there yet. Okay. Is that something that you think you might explore as you go? I think you said you're you're currently doing four levels and you're working to expand that out into seven. Is that a place that you're intending to explore with your class, or is is it not um, to that level yet? No, I don't think we have time in such a sh short uh, period of time to, to okay. cover so much. So okay. I have to stop at maximum four levels. So. I see. Okay. Well, thanks, Nick. Um, that does wrap up the Q&A. Um, for our audience, if you have other questions or comments that just didn't send in today, uh, I invite you to post those on the forum of our community site. You'll find that at community.vitechcorp.com. I hope everyone will join us for the rest of our webinar series, which continues through June. For details and registration, visit our website, vitechcorp.com. In closing, I'd like to thank Nick for presenting today. I'd especially like to thank all of our audience for attending. As we bring this webinar to a close, a survey will open on your screen, either in a new tab or a new window. Please take a moment to provide us with feedback on today's presentation and what topics you'd like to see covered in future webinars. Thank you for joining us and have a great day.